Um, hello, everyone. This is the session about hands on activities, and we are going to talk about hands on activities. I hope we will have interesting in conversations. Every talk can be um, followed by a 10 minute discussion. Um, and so it's going to be hopefully exciting. Let me introduce the first speaker. She is also from the JKU, uh, one of my colleagues. Um, she works on similar fields um, as I do, so our talks are a bit combined. And give a warm welcome to Julia. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, can you share your screen or do you have trouble? I think it works, does it? Great. Okay, so you see my screen? All good. Okay. So, hi everybody, my name is Julia, and today I would like to tell you about Logifaces, a game with many faces, pun intended. And this is a joint work of Eva, Ben Haas, Scholt Lavitska, and myself here at um, JKU. So today I will cover the following topics. I will talk to you about the context of this research. I will tell you about our research questions, about the game Logifaces and its relation to mathematics and arts. And then I will talk about some playing and learning with Logifaces. And then I will give our results and a short outlook. So let's start with the context of this research. Um, the student sample we used in our research was very young students because um, math and art are combined on a daily basis in early childhood education. So we can move on to older students later on. We also worked with students with diagnosed mathematical learning disabilities or MLD. And due to the known individual educational needs of MLD students, we hope that the developments of their mathematical skills can be detected by the teacher more easily. We use the game Logifaces and the game blocks as manipulatives. Manipulatives are physical materials that can be used to demonstrate or help investigate mathematical concept. And research suggests that using manipulatives can have a positive impact on students' mathema mathematical literacy and understanding of mathematical concepts. And it also states that it should bring fun. An international group of teachers and researchers from Austria, Finland, Hungary, and Serbia are working together on the Erasmus Plus project, Logifaces, an analog game for digital minds. And the core element within the goals of the Logifaces method is enhancing students' spatial reasoning and three-dimensional thinking. Now, this brings us to the following research questions. What impact does using manipulatives such as the game Logifaces have on students with mathematical disabilities? And what tasks can enhance students' development of spatial reasoning and recognizing patterns in early childhood education while using the game Logifaces? So what is this game? The game was created by Daniel Lakos of Plan Bureau in Budapest. And it has won a Hungarian design award and was featured on several design and related and art related sites. And the game only has one rule that you can see here in the GIF. So you have several blocks and you can basically create whatever you want. The only, the only rule of the game is to create a continuous smooth surface. Now the relation to mathematics and arts. Let's start with the blocks of the game. The game consists of a set of nine or 16 blocks with equilateral triangles as a base and possibly varying heights of each corner. This results in blocks and block sides with different slopes and area sizes. Now there are 11 different shapes, as you can see here, they are listed here. Um, three are prisms, so they have equal heights. You can see them here on the picture. This is the the small prison with the height one on one. This is the biggest prison with the height two to three. Then there are six truncated triangular prisons. 
And the last two blocks are mirror images that have all three heights. You can also see them here in the picture here, one, two, three, or one, three, two. Now, there are sets of nine or of 16 blocks, and it is possible to create a bigger equilateral triangle as a triangular tessellation with a continuous upper surface. Now, there are 22 solutions for the big triangle with 16 blocks, but there are already 4,942 if you combine the two sets and use 25 blocks. Now, how does this game uh, how can this game be connected to art? As you can see in these examples, there are plenty of artworks that make use of geometric abstraction um, and geometric abstraction plays an important role in art. The prime example is cubism, which revolutionized the field of the fine arts, painting and sculpture in the early 20th century. It also influenced other movements in arts and architecture that followed like abstract art, futurism, suprematism, constructivism, Steel steel or art deco to just name a few. And Lottie Faces is also connected to pattern creation, which can play, which plays a big role in early childhood education. So the students can engage with patterns along at least two different dimensions. One is structure, so for example, if they use prisms or truncated prisms, one is content with different materials, shapes, and colors, and one is complexity. So let's talk about playing and learning with logic faces. We started to collect data from task-based interviews and additional field observations with nine early childhood children for five weeks in Luxembourg, where this was possible due to the open schools at this time. And first, we let the students experiment with the puzzles in a collaborative approach with groups of two to three students. And the students could choose between a 3D printed set of logic faces, as you can see here, and um, the original concrete version that I showed you before. Some organized the logic faces by color, some by similar faces, and some connected two or three logic faces with the correct side. This incited active discussions among students and on how to organize the pieces. The conversations were also connected to several art pieces that the students discovered in class, such as paintings of Kandinsky or um, uh, geometric shapes on architecture, like the Louvre's entrance, which is a pyramid shape. Within the peer approach, students discussed and discovered patterns of their creations, for example, based on colors, shapes, and surfaces. And we noticed that the students developed new strategies in spatial reasoning and line patterns while manipulating the logic faces. Thus, the creations gained complexity regarding the colors and numbers of pieces they used in the patterns, and they were always driven by aesthetic appeal. The results. The children showed increased skill development in the areas of mathematics and art. And due to students' iterative testing of materials in a creative approach, the students felt more secure in solving open-ended tasks over time. They discovered more and more mathematical features of the blocks, and thus their development of geometric reasoning and spatial organization also improved. Aesthetics always played an important role in the patterns that the students created. The students developed their artistic skills further in the process, and it was like the students were drawing by using the logic faces blocks fully in flow with their creative process. Other positive findings included the peer interactions that led to a visible development of students' meta language and thus allowing different paces for the students. All students showed a high level of motivation and high engagement. They enjoyed playing and learning with the logic faces blocks so much that they repeatedly requested to use the blocks again in class. And the teachers also rated the learning experience with logic faces very highly and plan on working again with the game and continuing to work with the game. And the outlook. Now, um, since the usage of manipulatives fostered collaboration and social learning, this can be one interesting step for further research. And as I said before, regarding the sample, we want to move on to older students. And in the Logi Faces project, um, a wide range of exercises regarding age groups, school types, and school subjects are being created right now 
each meeting different students' requirements. So it is our goal to test those in the field and conduct future research on this. If um, the COVID situation improves, combining this work with 3D printing and other puzzles and games that can be used as manipulative is another interesting direction for this research. And you will hear more about that in the next talk that will be presented by Eva. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. I have no idea how you did that, but this is timed so well. This is excellent. I timed it many times. <laughs> <laughs> you had a lot of practice, I assume. Um, yeah, okay. uh, probably somebody is interested in something that they want to know in more detail from you now. So probably if you have some questions, um, kindly please either type them in the chat or just raise your hand so I can um, I can just call you and yes Brian what would you like to know so um, as a high school teacher who's already intrigued with these types of things that's that's fabulous I could already imagine a bunch of things that uh, would be appropriate for my freshmen and sophomores. What my, so my question is, what groundwork has already been laid for that transition into um, higher age groups? Um, is it extensive? Is it just getting started? Where, where are we at in the world of, of such things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already started, but you can still um, contribute if you have if you have yes, some. Ideas. Please. Yes, um, we are currently we are currently developing ideas with many different teachers from many different age groups. So it's not like all the teachers from the older age groups know about all the other um, exercises. So um, yeah, currently we are just uh, waiting for COVID to stop so that we can actually uh, conduct our research in, in peace everywhere. So there are some exercises, but if you wish to contribute and if you have ideas, um, we are nowhere from being ready. So we still look for more exercises. And of course, also for um, teachers to test them in class, because at the end of the project, we want to have a book where you can search for various tags, like for um, 10 year old students wanting to learn about mathematics and arts, so you um, can get the exact exercises that fit your purpose and fit your needs and the needs of your students, of course. Yeah, anything else except for can I use it? Because, of course, you can. You're very welcome. and, and Oh, we are happy about ideas, how to use it. So um, is there anything maybe that connects to your own research? Sorry. Because otherwise I would have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Ah, Branko has a question, of course. Branko, you may. Hello. Uh, I'm Branko. Uh, still, I am at University of Montenegro, but I hope soon I will, I will be in, in Linz. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, did you have a, a case when the students uh, working with uh, this shape create something uh, uh, which is connected uh, with education in biology, for example, flower part of some organs or something similar? Because when you are uh, present what could be uh, created. I, in my mind, I try to connect something in shape, for example, a flower or leaf or something like it. That's a really cool idea. Actually, I think we have one or two biology exercises, maybe, or was that chemistry? I'm not sure. So um, we are trying to connect as many subjects to logic phases as possible. So I think biology would also be a great topic to, to connect here. It's a great idea. Yeah, I also actually think that we should have biology exercises in the project. I think we have, we have a couple of biology yes, exercises, we do. But, I'm, but I'm not sure for which age group. So yeah, maybe we can talk about that later and add your ideas to our... Yeah, and this is already a question that I have regarding the age groups. It came to my mind when, when, when Brian asked about the older children, the older students. Um, since we have many different countries participating in the project, such as Serbia and Finland and Hungary and Austria. Um, 
the cur curricula are not always the same in each country. So probably one, um, one exercise would work well in, in one age group in one country and another exercise in a different country. Do you think that we can create exercises that can be used in for multiple um, age groups, like more more benign, like like can be used for anything? Yes, of course, of course. I think there are many exercises that, um, especially when you talk about art, I think sometimes it makes no sense to to narrow it to a to a certain age group. I think in some subjects it's easier to go through the various age group and. It's also very individual concerning the students and their mm -hmm. interests. I think some of our exercises are just different ways to play with the game. And I think this can be fun for small children and for big children like myself. <laughs> and then um, Juliana and Philip both had questions. I don't know who was first, probably Juliana. Um, you go first. She asks about methodology. Would you like to read your question? We can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I have the question. Are you mega best? <laughs> we have a potential so, user. It's going to be published a methodological book. Uh, usually in this uh, Erasmus Plus uh, project, uh, we publish some methodological book. Uh, and if you have something published, uh, which can be found on the internet, um, with loggy faces. This activity. Are you uh, mad to be somewhere? <laughs> I think um, we have um, we have started on writing about this, but there's not much published yet. So we just submitted a short paper for Bridges, but um, the other things are still to be written. So it, it's a project uh, under. Um, running so it's running now this project yes it's the running yes thank you philip what would you what would you like to ask yeah i have a very specific question and sorry if i'm too specific uh but the project uh didn't seem of, uh, yeah he's not so famous but uh in mathematics education he is famous uh georges prisonier uh, who invented the cuisinier rods and I, what I'm asking, but maybe if you never heard of it, you really should investigate it because he became famous, uh, yeah, with the cuisinier rods. Um, and I was wondering how it was is linked to this project. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you really should uh, look it up because he really, really became very famous uh, okay. with these rods. Yes, we definitely should do so. I'm. I didn't understand, but I don't think I heard the name before. So if you can text it to me, that would be amazing. And then yeah, I, I, I will put it in the chat because I think there are some similarities between what he did 40 years ago and, and what you are doing now. Okay, that's really cool. Thank you so much. And now I think, um, Eva, we should move on to your talk. So. I will give the floor to you to introduce me then. <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. Um, so everybody, now our next talk uh, will be given to you by Eva, one of my colleagues and friends at JKU. And she will talk to us about 3D printing because Eva is our 3D printing queen of JKU who already organized an amazing 3D printing conference, I think last week, the week before, I don't know, it was, just feels like ages ago. Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. And um, so, Ifa, are you ready with your presentation? I sure hope that screen sharing works. If it doesn't, I will switch to another computer. I can do it. For Sometimes you. if my Zoom is running on this computer for quite some time, which is it, it is like now, um, it's overwhelmed and then screen sharing is not working. So, please okay. fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Can you see something? It says you started screen sharing. Ah, that's a bad sign. I hope it works. Okay, how about I share the screen for you? Oh, now it's working. Now it's working. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Are you sure it works? 
I, can I think see. I will just leave it as it is. And, and, and okay. Brian says no. Can everybody see Eva's screen? Because I can see it. So. Okay. Maybe it's just a question of bandwidth. Now I can see it. Okay, that's good. It's perfect. Okay, um, I'm not going to switch to presentation view because then probably it's not going to work anymore. So we'll just go through the slides. Um, okay. Uh, as you maybe have already guessed, it's about a game named Logi Faces. And um, I also have some examples here. Ah, those things look like this. Those are 3D printed versions of LogiFaces tiles of those blocks that it's, it's consisting of. They are in glow in the dark filament, and this is really cool. Um, and I'm going to talk about how this game can inspire students um, for, for, for 3D printing and especially train teachers for 3D printing, because in contrast to what you already heard, this thing this game can not only just foster uh, mathematical thinking and teach students about, I don't know, vectors and geometry, it can also help um, teachers to learn something. And this is where I come in because this is what I research. I research um, how self-created resources from, from, um, from digital fabrication, such as 3, 3D printing, can be used for, for useful for teachers and what benefits they can have from that and which prerequisites they need and, and what they have to believe in. And uh, Julia already explained that this is an Erasmus Plus project and it's from Plan Bureau, from Dani and Esther, which you can see on the picture there, that the, they developed the game. This is also Dani with me at a workshop with teachers and this is what I did. Um, there are many. Ah, yes. This is just a question from Julia to put the questions in, some questions in the chat. Um, there are many uh, things that I tried out to find out whether teachers can use this, and especially using 3D printing. And we found that 3D printing has lots of values um, with students especially for math teaching. And what we did was uh, we did teacher interviews during the pandemic, especially during first lockdown to find out how their teaching changed. And then we did brainstorming workshops when kind of it was a bit more clear to talk with teachers, such as you can see in the center, um, how it can be used during teaching and what comes into my, their minds when they see it 3D printed and how they would use their 3D printed versions. And then we also did the virtual workshop with around 50 teachers in Asia. This is where, where what you see on the right side with Dani, because um, since we like 3D printers for everyone, we just did paper folding with them. Um, and this is some feed, these are some feedbacks that we got from especially the interviews in the beginning as, as an orientation. So we were told that it's very nice to touch we had, this was quite awkward. We had some people, we also presented it at the Asa Electronica Festival and we had some people rubbing it all the time and, and touching it because it was so cool to the touch and so smooth. Um, and that was really impractical because we always had to disinfect it then. Um, but this is already a benefit of the 3D printed versions. In contrast, as you can see here with the original game, um, the, the original game is, concrete and uh, 3D printed versions can be um, out, of, out of plastics. So it's much easier to handle in classrooms in pandemic times. And of course, it's much easier to, to be used in pandemic times. And then of course, they can be used as manipulatives and they have some physical attributes. So touching them does have a value which cannot be um, seen when you just talk about it or have an augmented reality version of it. And then what we found is that it really sparks ideas just with like with Brian, sometimes teachers get really interesting ideas how to use these blocks. And it's really interesting also for crossover um, things with other subjects, such as of course, 
completely obvious, we got triangles in art all the time and also in architecture. And as you can probably see already with the stadium, um, those triangles, they already look a bit like a mesh. And now it's, it gets theoretical because um, this is the basis of 3D printing. 3D printing just basically only consists of triangles in contrast to um, computer-aided design where you can define uh, round shapes. You cannot do that with 3D printing. Everything does have a shape. So a round shape is just an enorm enormous uh, amount of triangles. And those logic faces tiles, they were created onto your Jebra and downloaded. They also consist of triangles. And so um, this can be a valuable geometrical lesson, not only to just look at the tiles, but also look at the structure, creating them um, in, in three dimensions and making a three dimensional mesh. And also learning about volumes and, and, and things while 3D printing it, because what we found is that it's not really intuitive if you make one of these three prints a bit bigger then the printing time is not linear it's not like twice as big as twice as long time it's just a huge difference and so this is what what teachers um, were very surprised about and then this is the logic versus workshop that i was talking about we had about 50 teachers from indonesia and other um, other countries from asia and we introduced the game, we did the paper folding, like I said, we did GeoGebra examples, as I indicated previously. Um, we talked about 3D printing and how this can be used for 3D printing easily, how GeoGebra can be used for downloads for 3D printing. And about half of them had multiple subjects and half of them were more or less math teachers. And two thirds of them were new to GeoGebra. And then we did, did some 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 survey some feedback we asked them whether it had benefits whether this 3d printing and 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 geogebra and logic faces had any value to them and they told us as you can see in the word cloud the most interesting thing for them was that games can be useful and can spark creativity and interest and thinking and and it can be used for science and it's uh, joyful and especially it makes it, it's a great source for fun. So people just have enormous fun using this while learning a tons about mathematics and engineering. And the first um, statement is the one that I am proud most because this person gave us the feedback that they previously just thought that people playing games wasted their time, but they don't. They uh, just learn like thousands of things while not even mentioning that they're learning. And they were very surprised that um, 3D printing as a medium can be used and can be very useful. And they were really surprised about 3D printing in general. And what this is what we, what we think, what we derive from this, that teachers basically need examples for 3D printing, such as logic faces. They need, um, for example, on GeoGebra, they need uh, resources to check out, to try out um, those logic faces on GeoGebra, which, which I created. If you're interested, you can then later have the link. They can also be used in augmented reality environments, and they can be used to train 3D printing. And then first teachers learn it. And I'm sure if teachers find that they can use it, then all other students will have a benefit because then the teachers are not scared of it anymore. Um, and as Julia already said, we already tried this with students also. And this is something where my colleague Branko um, was part of. We already started testing 3D printing in Montenegro. Um, and there we had around 200 teachers, which we trained. And this is what they came up later in the competition. So they had some amazing results for, for students that have disabilities. And we used 3D printing also at the Ars Electronica, creating huge, or actually basically mazes in, um, in GeoGebra, which can of course be used using augmented reality in a huge version where you can actually walk through your own map. That was also very, very funny for people to look at and to experience. That was when, when they 
were rubbing the, the tiles all the time and touching it and, and playing with it. Um, yeah, and my 10 minutes, I'm afraid, are over, but I welcome any questions. And if you have any suggestions about anything, and if something sparks to your mind, and, and if you're interested in something, please just write to me or write to anyone. Just contact us on Slack. Tell us your ideas. Tell us your thoughts. And I leave you with this very um, precious slide for me, because this, this contains what I was never dreaming about, just changing somebody's beliefs in something. And now I stop. I hope you have some questions. Any questions for you? Well, if you just like it, there's the GeoGebra version online. You can download any tile you want and, and also the instructions how to play the game and also the folding instructions that are um, that can be used and try it out please try it out and, and tell us your experiences and tell us whether you're a, a teacher that now maybe understands something better i can share the link of course just let me search for it it's just if I use GeoGebra on my computer, then sometimes it's, it's, it costs my computer so many resources that I can't share my screen. So I have to open it and I have to sign in. Other questions to Eva? Yes, please, Philip. I have one. I, it's, a, it's, it, it's a bit of a lame Duke question, but I'm quite interested in uh, how are you coping with the COVID uh, uh, situation? Because I can imagine that it's very hard to do this kind of research uh, at this very moment. Yeah, but then again, it's about 3D printing, right? You can produce your own stuff where you live. And I can, I can just share this link and then Brian at the I know Brian has like tons and tons and tons of really awesome printers so he can just go there uh, when he gets morning then maybe if he is not he's not completely fallen asleep and he can just print them and he can play with it already today and there's also some links for exercises in the GeoGebra book so you can check them out and just test what you want to do with it uh during COVID, I've been experimenting with using, um, especially at the beginning, we use 3D printing to produce individual sets of mm. our manipulatives. And then we distributed them um, at a big supply pickup to all of the students at our school so that everyone had their own set of manipulatives awesome at home, idea. which would have been impossible without 3D printing. So basically, this is just if you want something physical, then this is just the technology for the situation, actually. And as we've already seen this, like, like, it's not something new, you know, 3D printing is as old as I am, and I'm quite old. So this is not like, like, surprise, we've got a special new uh, technology that you can now use for your convenience. And also paper folding. I mean, it's not like that's something developed in the last two weeks. Um, there are two people raising their hands, I think. How, how is this to handle? Brian, please. I'm already fine. Okay. So uh, it's a question that I originally asked in uh, Yulia's, but it, it applies to either one of you. Has anyone, uh, I saw the variations in Eva's presentation, has anybody experimented with designs that um, have more so sophisticated base shapes um, and whether gameplay can be modified or twisted? Has anybody messed around with that idea? Basically, yes, Diego did. Um, not in, in, in this logic phases context, because our goal is to identify possible um, advantages of exactly this game. But in general, yes, um, 
Diego had the idea of, of just taking two dimensional games and this, this game was de developed quite similarly, similarly um, take a two dimensional game and then add another dimension because basically this game as it is would not really work with, with um, two dimensions well. So there is one more dimension added to this. You can probably make the, the corners colored and not in, in different heights, but the different heights, they, they provide some kind of slope and the slope can be, for example, used for physics and the angle can be calculated and all of this would not work well if you just had the triangle basis because it's just an equilateral triangle. If you try the fractals, right? So there's ideas to, to create something like this with fractals. So I'd like yeah, to... imagine a fractal that goes into three dimensions and two right, dimensions. Yes, yeah. yeah, so now we only have the two dimensional fractal puzzles, but we want to go in three dimensions. So, okay, thank you so much. I think um, if there are no questions, I think we should move on and thank our speaker again. Thank you, Eva. <laughs> 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 okay. Our next speaker is Adi. Hi, are you ready? Do you have your presentation ready? Okay, hi, thank you, uh, Ilya. And yeah, okay, let me start for my slide. Okay, this work? Yes. Okay, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Adi Nur Cahyono. I'm from Indonesia, from Universitas Negeri Semarang. And yeah, actually, I have the question to Eva, but uh, I will keep it and then I give the question in the end of my slides because it's related with the, uh, the next uh, project that I uh, uh, have an idea about that. So perhaps the, uh, we can discuss later. Yeah, my talk is about the augmented reality, mobile materials, and this is a, a we talk that this is a digital transformation in other uh, STEAM education. And yeah, yeah, of course, uh, when we talk about the technology in education, so yeah, of course, the concept of education is very important uh, as a basis, and we can consider that, uh, for example, Dewey and Kant's Education is a process that uh, uh, process of reconstruction uh, experience. So the knowledge is actively construct by learner. So this is a constructivism uh, 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 paradigm. And then uh, I use uh, the the framework for my projects uh, using the didactic situations that. Uh, uh, in the learning process, uh, of course, there is a learner or students uh, who adopt all the their environment and then uh, so that uh, they can the new knowledge and yeah okay and then the, they work with the milieu or environment and uh, the aim is to get the new knowledge yeah and then this is the 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 didactic situation that the teacher uh, play a role as a facilitator to prepare the the environment and also organizing the uh, environment and uh, teaching the students and acculturation with the students and so this is the, the concept of didactic situation and now we talk about the outdoor education considered as uh, education in for and about the outdoor and this means that this educational process is taking place uh, outdoor place and the learning is uh, about the nature and the purpose of this method is uh, uh, of learning is for the future benefit of the, the environment and outdoor is located in the intersection of uh, three area, namely outdoor activities and environment educations and also the personal and social development. And yeah, uh, yeah, this is uh, my focus on the one area, but I still supplement by other area and this is the outdoor uh, education. And the uh, other calls go hand in uh, hand to provide the possible uh, integrated STEM pedagogical uh, framework. So this is a work that uh, uh, we can work in outdoor activities uh, and combining with the concept of the technology, engineering, mathematics, and arts. And we have the projects. Uh, perhaps you already know about uh, Mad City Map because uh, uh, 
Uh, I finished my PhD from uh, Frankfurt with uh, Matthias. And yeah, uh, in 2013 until 2017, I worked with uh, uh, Matthias for uh, uh, study about the uh, Match City Map. And especially, I work in uh, Indonesia. So uh, we try to develop the Match City Map, especially for the Indonesian context. And yeah, along with the math trials, the students in group will encounter a series of real world problems and they are to solve the problem and with the practical ends, such as the design, manufacture, and uh, operation of machines, process, and system. And then we, with the help of the uh, smartphone application students in group lo uh, for locations and solve five to six problems in a trials. Yeah, this is the concept of the, the math, uh, math city map, or this is how uh, we call this as uh, mobile math trials. This is an example of the problem in Indonesia. Uh, yeah, I have a, this is an example of an outdoor uh, task related to engineering context. I think that it involves a cross-disciplinary concept that, uh, as we know that in Semarang, there is a flood. Uh, this is a, uh, because in the below, the, uh, in the low level of the sea level and yeah, this uh, we have the problem with the flood in the city, and yeah, so we have to uh, educate the students not only about the mathematics but also educate about the, the environment. That, uh, for example, that suppose you are city in you no know, in uh, emergency and you are asked to raise the flood gate one meter from its original, and then the the question is how many times must to warm drive to rotate to raise the slice uh, uh, slice one matter from its uh, original position. And this is, uh, I'll talk about the flood and then the old town. This is the tourism uh, uh, place. And then this is emergency. And this is an example of the question of the uh, answer of the, from the students. Then they try to understanding the problem and identifying the relevant mathematics and transforming real world problem into the mathematic problem and solving mathematic problem and interpreting the mathematical solutions. And this is what we call as a mathematician or in Germany, we have the concept of the mathematical modeling. Yeah. Okay, this is an example. And then we have another example. And this is about the real problem about arts. It is in the, the Australia because we try to uh, develop the match team map also in uh, neighbor of the Indonesia, not only in Indonesia, but uh, in also in other uh, countries and but uh, this is also interesting when we try to develop the mathematics math city map in indonesia because uh, yeah uh, indonesia have the uh, uh, about 17000 islands and yeah the, you can uh, have the already visit in indonesia and this is one example of the the math city map materials in the 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 the, the island this is an uh, 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 uninhabited uh, island, and we uh, go to the, the island with a small uh, foot, and then we create the Met City Map trials there, and then uh, we can try to uh, educate the, the people there about the, the, the environment also by using the Met City Map. And this is also uh, interesting. And, we can work with a Match City Map portal and the students work with the Match City Map apps. And because of the yeah, the use of the augmented reality provides an efficient way to represent the model that need visualization and support the seamless interaction between the real and virtual environment. So uh, we try to uh, bring the uh, augmented reality into the Match uh, City Map or Match Trails uh, idea. So I try to, uh, I with my, uh, with my team, uh, research team in Indonesia, try to uh, combine between the augmented reality with the mobile material. So uh, the students go to outside the classroom and uh, solve the problem, and they will get the hints with the, the augmented reality. Because as we know, that this is uh, uh, difficult when the students uh, go to uh, go outside the classroom and bring the physical uh, manipulative. So we have an idea to. Uh, uh, Thing, uh, to give the students with the augmented reality uh, to try to solve the problem. So, for example, this is an example of the task in the, the school years about uh, estimate the number of fish. Yeah, I think this is not only mathematics, but also about the science because uh, they have to know about uh, uh, when there is a pond and then uh, how many uh, fish that uh, can live there. And 
Okay, they will learn and if they have an idea and then they can uh, use the apps and try to the scan and uh, they use the marker and then uh, they will so the see the 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 objects in the uh, virtually and then they can try to solve the problem and this is an example of the uh, solutions from the students and there's another example of the the augmented reality that they create by using the unity uh, software and uh, there is some example and uh, i think this is related with the uh, computational thinking especially about the decomposition when we, they have the problem in a big problem and then they can uh, uh, make the partitions uh, into the several uh, object and they can solve it's a uh, uh, problem and then they can combine and then they will solve the, all of the problem and this is also about the net of the cube and others yeah this is now our idea in the 2019 to 2020 to bring the augmented reality into the uh, the, the outdoor activities and of course this is related with the stem education and this is uh, the result of the the, the experiment with the students in the junior high schools and uh, we uh, have the uh, finding that uh, augmented reality mobile materials has a positive impact on student motivation uh, to be involved in the learning activities so we uh, have the, the aim is to improve the motivation and then uh, with the improvement of the motivation the students uh, mathematical modeling will also the improved uh, uh, with this uh, project, and this is uh, uh, the the records of the activities. We uh, give the teacher trainings in my in our laboratory in uh, uh, Universitas Negeri Semarang, and uh, the teachers try to develop the task, designing the task by themselves, and then uh, their tasks uh, will uh, they give this task to the, the students and they uh, put some of the tasks into the Match City Map portal and then they use uh, this uh, Match City Map task to the students and the students uh, uh, doing the activity outdoors with these uh, apps and then uh, we make the observations and, uh, uh, and then also interview them and uh, this is some of the documentation of the student activities in the, the city uh, parks and also in the, the, the school yards and the tourism uh, places. And when they use uh, these uh, the apps, okay, I think I will can uh, skip. And okay, this is uh, the my idea and this is uh, some of the reference that uh, uh, when we start for saying them since from the beginning we uh, work with uh, uh, materials and yeah as we know that material is uh, uh, start from 1984 in australia this is a uh, materials and then uh, matthias uh, have an idea to bring the met, uh, materials uh, with the mobile apps and then we have the mobile materials uh, mobile materials and then uh, then with uh, matthias also we try to bring the augmented reality into the materials uh, idea and for the next uh, yeah i have an idea to uh, try to bring the match city map augmented reality and also GeoGebra and also uh, it is also possibilities have the 3d printing to bring to the yeah uh, yeah this is also i have the some of the discussion with the results about this and actually this uh, today i have the uh, this is a deadline of the submission of the uh, proposal for the research and hopefully this is will cool and then i can visit uh, Lins for doing some projects also perhaps with uh, Eva. I think for the about uh, 3D printings. Okay, thank you very much for the attention. And this is uh, my uh, email address and also uh, page. And then uh, you can contact. And perhaps uh, this is also interesting when you uh, would like to visit Indonesia in the future and we can doing some project together. In yeah, okay. Thank you very much and. Uh, if you have any comment or feedback, please. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. This is really amazing. Shirin already has an idea, I think.
Yes. <laughs> She's already blooming yes. from ideas. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking I'm doing architecture in GeoGebra. So uh, I was looking forward to integrate it with the map, city maps in order to, for the students to investigate the models where they solving paths. So I think uh, there's a good collaboration point, uh, but I also had a question. Uh, when you're implementing the augmented reality in the map city maps, I uh, noticed that you're only uh, using the marker-based approach, but uh, I think there's also the approach of the uh, location-based. So um, you can integrate it with the GPS, I think you know, of course, and then uh, you can just draw the paths while the GPS uh, gets your location, your coordinates. So it does not have only to be a marker based, it can also be a marker less based. So maybe this is a, would be a very good point for further investigation. Okay. And thank you for your talk. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, okay, this is also the, yeah, we have the, uh, the development uh, still uh, developed the, our uh, project about augmented reality, and this is uh, in the beginning we use the marker and the uh, and then actually uh, uh, we already try to develop about the when they come to the location and then the uh, the object will. So I think this uh, uh, this is like the Pokemon uh, apps that has, uh, they we come to come to the location and they will show the the. Uh, Pokemon and others. I think this is also yeah interesting, and then we can uh, develop in the future. And also, I have another idea that uh, I think uh, this is not easy to create the the the, the objects, uh, the 3D objects with the, the other software. But uh, uh, I have uh, an idea that uh, in the future, I think uh, it is enough to use the the GeoGebra because the GeoGebra already have the uh, augmented reality, so we don't need to create the the create the 3D objects by using the other software. But uh, already uh, GeoGebra already have the 3D uh, yeah, augmented reality and also 3D printing. I think in the future uh, it is more simple to use the GeoGebra. I think. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Shirin. Yeah, I think um, Julia. Borfinger already showed us how um, GeoGebra works with augmented reality and they have new features. So I'm sure, I, I know that Gregor was really interested in that. So probably this will be somehow used maybe in your future projects. Anybody else with a question? Because if not, then I'm just going to say what I really, really loved about your, your presentation. Uh, what I really liked is that you, you actually use hands-on activities showing students how they can use um, their surroundings and also their skills, skills with their um, ordinary lives or with, their, with real life problems. And I think this is what math actually should be. This is something that I encountered during my studies when I came um, connected to the talk from Konstantinos. I came and, and started to study and it was like completely different language. It was like the, the mathematics uh, lecturers had such a clear picture of the words that they were saying. And I was just writing down, I don't know, some, some, some strange marks, which then meant something in the Greek alphabet, which I had never heard before. <laughs> and they were telling me things like proofs. And I was like, okay, how can you, this is just, you know, this is made up, this is math, this is just, we think about this. You, how, how are you proving this? Ah, yeah, I'm only proving this in yourself so it was a relief when later i had the possibility to use this with real world applications so i believe what you do for students is give them back math i think this this creates a distance and you give it back to them yeah <laughs> so i really love this Okay, thank you for that. In the future, we can uh, make the collaboration with uh, you and also try to bring the yeah cross uh, cross countries uh, activities in mathematics also between yes, Indonesia between Germany and, also and Austria, Austria uh, because we are very far yes. apart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Come and pass by in Egypt first. You all, yes. and then we fly yes. together to We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Yeah, that's true. Ah, Brian already has morning, I see. He just, I think the sun went up <laughs> at his place. 
<laughs> and so I, I would like to give the floor to you and um, to have you presenting right now, if, if you want to. We are really eager to listen to what you have to say, because this is a topic that is something very interesting for me, especially. All right. Um, I figured I'd use this background since this is what everybody believes that it means to live in California. And uh, so I thought I would just support the dream. I don't know. It doesn't look at all like this when I walk outside, but uh, that's all right. Um, all right. Let me work on the screen share process. It's always a, a magical moment when it actually happens exactly how you intended. So we'll see if that is uh, how this goes down. Excellent, we can yeah. see everything. Beautiful. Um, I ran a bunch of experiments last night with my kids uh, on their computers and their phones, so it paid off. Um, so I am uh, now becoming more and more affiliated with uh, JKU Lens uh, from my remote location in California. I'm not a official yet. And so as far as research projects go, um, I am at ground, like basement level, sub basement three, somewhere in there. Um, so I don't have any specific research project formulated yet. However, um, I've been affiliated with my local university in um, Japanese lesson study for the past 15 years, uh, got my, my teaching started in that sense. Um, and now that idea of researching with action in the classroom and coming up with different and better ways to do things that are focused on um, student learning outcomes themselves rather than just what we think might be happening um, has really intensified over the last four years as I've been able to help develop a brand new small scale charter school that focuses on uh, advanced manufacturing and commercial construction. So we have a full wood shop and are working on building out a full metal shop, including, um, uh, I think we're ordering our second and third 75 watt um, lasers. Um, I have a, uh, a 40 watt laser in my classroom, my own 3D printer. We have 32 uh, active 3D printers on site. We have um, CNC machines, plasma cutters, welding booths. So fabrication is what we do. Um, we try to help the students dream things up and then we try to help them make it a reality. Um, that all in and of itself is really cool, but it turns out that teaching a rigorous high school level, pre-college um, mathematics curriculum in that context isn't as well charted a territory as I would like. Um, and I'm looking for ways to tie those two things together so that math in my world isn't a silo as it is in a lot of American schools, even ones with amazing resources, often in their collaboration, leave mathematics all by itself. And they just march through the math curriculum and they let all the cool stuff happen in other classrooms connecting to um, art and science and even um, English and history will tie in sometimes more effectively than the math teachers uh, manage to do. Sometimes I, I blame the math teachers, sometimes I blame others, it doesn't really matter. Um, but one of the driving forces that I feel gets in the way is how we communicate with students in all classrooms, but really notably in a classical American math classroom where we like to stick numbers on the top of pages and we like to believe that we know what it means and we like to believe that the student knows what it means to receive a particular grade on something. Um, and our traditional grading systems just totally fall flat in communicating any ability for, for true feedback, growth and development, and they also fight any really inventive output because how do you put a number on that creative process and all of the different aspects that go into it 
and the mathematics that you're pulling out. I can't look at somebody's project and say, oh, that's an 87%. Like, I, I have no idea what that means. So that's the foundation. Let me quickly foundation. interrupt you and ask you, we only see the um, first slide. Is this intentionally? Yes. Okay, so then I, I'm fine. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Round level base, base uh, kind of groundwork. So that's where I'm at. Um, what do these numbers really communicate? A lot of times, I think if we're honest, we wouldn't know how to answer that question ourselves. And our students definitely know even less about what that number really means than, than we do. So what I've done over the past four years that leads up to where I'm at and, and kind of where I want to jump off into research land at some point is I've broken down uh, the grading system at our school. I was in charge of developing it. So I just threw out everything I knew about grading, um, did a whole bunch of research, and I broke down into, okay, what's the scale we're going to use? What are we going to actually communicate? Will it be a number? Will it be a letter? Um, how, how are we going to actually write something down to communicate with a student so it doesn't always have to be in sentences and notes? Um, what's the content that we're actually trying to get across? Is it the standards? Are there mathematical practices? Are there skills we want to focus on? Um, or is there something else that's actually important to teach the students? And if so, what is it? Um, and then how do we organize that system? Um, the traditional system I'll, I'll show uh, pretty much focuses on quizzes and tests and homework, maybe some participation if you're being feeling really creative. Um, but are there other ways to organize how you communicate with students so that you can actually engage in conversation with them? And then um, does the grading system elicit uh, or support growth, track growth in any particular way? Um, some of what I have looked at has been influenced by the work of Hattie and focusing on feedback and also um, the effectiveness of having systems at your school that every teacher engages in. Um, so the grading systems that I've been developing are used by every teacher at the school at every grade level, not just in my classroom. So that the methods we come up with to communicate about the projects that we have students do are consistent from one classroom to the another and students don't have to learn what, what it means in each classroom separately is at least the goal. Um, so I've been working on developing a feedback driven grading system um, that allows the development of student self assessment uh, in the process. Um, so skipping ahead. Um, I have a much longer talk that some of these slides come from. Um, content wise, we have a uh, each country has their own specific standards, um, but then there are a number of influences I've discovered as I've become really honest with myself about what it is that we teach. Um, our state or our nation has something to say about what we're supposed to be teaching. Our textbook doesn't always propose the same list, um, but whatever textbook we use has something to say about what we should be teaching. When push comes to shove, personal preference, what I want to teach, has a lot to say about what I teach. Um, the situation, the timing, the background of my students, um, where I am in the semester, whether I'm feeling pressed for time, are there national tests coming up, um, is there a break coming up, all of these influence what I teach, and I sometimes forget that all of those influences really have a big say in what goes on in the classroom. Um, more importantly, I feel like I have um, in the US, we have the mathematical practice standards, which were developed in, in uh, by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics back in 2000 and then adapted to our, um, to our current standards that focus less on content, but actually span K-12. Um, and these are things that I would love to focus on. If I could pick eight things to focus on in my classroom, my first go-to four years ago was, I wonder if I can organize my class based on these eight things um, and worry about traditional content um, separately. Turns out though, a lot of these are very difficult to measure um, 
and also don't translate necessarily perfectly to other classrooms. And I was looking for a, a grading system I could generalize. Um, so that's that was one set of ideas. Um, another set of ideas, because we work at a pathway school where every student is involved in hands-on action um, and we're connecting everything to science and English and history and um, and construction and manufacturing, it became important to realize that some of my content might need to be applications, formulas, graphs, decoding in the English classroom. If I'm going to, if they're going to use statistics in argumentation, I'm going to need, uh, even if it's not officially in the curriculum, to help students um, with that. Um, and what I came to the conclusion of is that really I wanted to do all of it. Um, but everybody knows that you don't even have time to do the parts you're supposed to do, um, much less adding to it and coming up with, with more. So this is the big question. Um, can I develop, um, can I have a fully developed, educationally driven makerspace that provides the context to drive actual rigorous math um, for high school and college prep students? Um, what years is that appropriate for? How many years can I do that for? What should the content be? What projects would drive that? And then most importantly, how do I give feedback that builds student confidence, their ability in mathematics, their creativity, their logical reasoning? Um, how do I actually help them through that process? Because I can just give them a, a project, but if they don't know the math that I want out of it, and I don't come up with a way to communicate what that should look like and give them feedback for growth in that process, it'll just be a pretty painting or a really cool 3D printed thingamajig uh, or a fidget spinner or, or maybe a game for their biology class. But I will have trouble helping them see the math that they want to learn if I don't have a way to communicate that. Um, so. I, how am I doing on time? Okay. Two more um, minutes. Two more? So, All right. Um, so up. what I did, <laughs> is fine. what I did is I took my original inspiration. I wonder if I can in, in, organize an entire class based entirely on the math practice standards. I combined that with Wolfram's research on computational thinking outcomes um, for his curriculum, which has 11 different things to track. And each of those is broken up into a bunch of sub items to track. It was quite overwhelming. Um, I looked at the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Assessment Criteria because they have a really excellent method of and, and well-developed method for tracking things that are difficult to work with uh, at times. And those in, in, that are familiar with the IB program, some of what I developed will look familiar because that was structurally probably my, my greatest eventual inspiration, even though that's not where I started. Um, and then I combined that with the four mathematical representations, like, okay, if in mathematics, everything needs to be able to be thought of as algebraic, graphic, numeric, prosaic, and I should be able to help students translate between them, maybe I can organize a feedback system that focuses on that. So I combined all of that together. And what I currently work with in my classroom are these 12 items. Um, and my grading system isn't based on tests, homework, participation, quizzes. My grade book is organized into these 12 categories. Um, one assignment might hit one or two or three or four, or for a big one, even five different categories. And by tracking how students do in these 12 areas, I can help them grow and have conversation with them in areas that I actually care about, rather than a student coming to me and saying, Mr. Sheldon, how do I raise my grade? And, and I look at their grade book and I go, well, you could do a lot better on tests. Um, maybe you should 
Look at your studying techniques or your homework grade is very low. Um, maybe you should set aside a little bit more time to get a little more of your homework completed and turned in on time. Or, or if I'm really feeling out there and inspired, in our class discussions, you don't really seem to share out that much. Maybe we could work on formulating questions or, or participating more. Like These are really vague conversations that are not nearly as useful to me or my students as everyone likes to like think that they are. Um, and so none of that appears in my gradebook. Only these 12 things are tracked in my gradebook, and assignments have to exist in one of these places in order for them to even uh, be in the calculation. So I'm probably just about out of time as far as that goes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Another, another, no, another time I can talk about how I've worked in growth uh, through the feedback process, um, but that's what I have for right now. Thank you very much. This is amazing. Awesome. Everybody is very impressed because this is, I think, something that we struggle a lot when, when um, having something that is very practical, that's not very theoretical. In my mind, um, grading somebody is only checking whether I did a good job in transporting information to somebody and if they understood what I wanted to understand. So this is maybe more a test for me than, for example, students or teachers or somebody. Um, so, yeah, does anybody have, have, have questions? Since the uh, talk was not complete, I assume there are some. Um, Julia, it, can you clarify working in a digital learning environment? Um, because I don't know, we were talking about grading and feedback and I was just wondering because to me it sounds a lot like because I'm, I'm working in a digital learning environment and I'm always thinking about learning analytics, like how to give this kind of feedback to the students. Is that what you are talking about or is it only in the in the classroom? So, so what's the context? It, the context in which it currently exists is in the classroom. Um, I have rubrics that are associated with those components, um, some more developed than others based on the number of activities that I've been able to come up with that actually hit those, um, those 12 areas. Um, my rubric for knowing, uh, or, um, knowing and applying mathematics is well much more developed than uh, domain and error um, or model analytics, because those are higher level uh, things that I haven't engaged as much with. Um, but I I work on for activities that I do developing a rubric that tells students what their outcome should be uh, at different levels of engagement with the activity. Not everybody has to like produce an epic thing in order for me to be happy. Like, here's, here's what I really want you to get out of this. And then here's some ways to go above and beyond, show some, some um, additional mathematical skills, some additional design incentive, some additional attention to detail. And I build that into the rubric and then I communicate that with the students so that they and I have a way to talk about what they've made from the beginning to the end. Um, all in this endeavor to figure out how to pull legit math out of something that's maybe a little fuzzy. Very interesting, thank you. Are there other questions? Comments? I do have comments. Um, this is something that, that I'm going to have to do this semester because for the first time I'm going to teach in an actual course at the university. And um, this is, um, those 12 principles, this, these are going to help me much, but they are like 60 students. So I don't, won't have time to, do, to go through all those 12 points with each of them. Um, and I'm always thinking that everybody always does their best. And I know that that's not the case, but I'm always amazed about every single project. So 
Is there, uh, do you have any hints, or any tips what to look out for if, if you don't have that much time to go into depth? Um, yeah, well, and my what I'm hoping for are um, partnerships that can help me develop projects and then I can take the, the grading setup and the thoughts on how to actually um, identify what to assess and, and looking at how to communicate that and kind of partner with activity designers because I struggle with the, the, the activity design component is like, okay, this is the math I wanna do. I have no idea what cool project would help me get that out of them. Um, I have the vocabulary to talk about it and some ideas on how to actually formalize the process. Um, so as far as, as the biggest tip is if you don't know what you want them to learn, you will have a really hard time communicating that to them. Um, and having some consistent systems in place for the knowing in advance, not just on one project, but overall, mm -hmm. what you really truly, when push comes to shove, what you really want them to learn beyond what's in the textbook or what's officially required of you on the syllabus or any of those things, and what you wanna be able to communicate and talk about, your, your system of communication needs to address those things, um, not the default stuff that you've always kept track of before, like mm -hmm. quizzes mm -hmm. and tests and homework submission. Yeah, because they were super surprised that I'm not going to do a test on 3D printing because why, that there's no point in that, what, what would I ask? Yeah, because I don't give very just, many tests. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so this means also probably as a guideline for them, if I'm clear in my goals, then they can probably have some more orientation on what they need to do. And with more time uh, outside of this context, I can show what rubrics I've developed so far, what my colleagues have developed, the kinds of mm -hmm. things we're successfully tracking, as opposed to the things where I'm like, I want to track this, but I have no idea how. Um, and then as far as research goes, if I want to look at, I mean, are these viable ways of, of keeping track of students learning? Does, does the ability to give this type of feedback help them in the long run? But those are longitudinal studies. I don't even have anywhere near the research background to know how to begin with. So that's, that's why I'm at, like at sub-basement level two on getting up to where I can actually do legit research that can help this improve um, or identify whether it's worth doing at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I will let you find what I experience. Uh, I will let you know what I what my findings are and what I experience is what I wanted to say. Um, and I think if there's there's probably room for one more question, but if we don't have any, then I'm afraid the time is up. Yeah. We can just, ah, Philip wants to say something. And Adi, oh no, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if you can answer, uh, but I'm uh, working on a paper about uh, which micro decisions teachers take, uh, teachers take to come up with a certain grades. So I did an experiment and I really have a fine grade overview on which decisions every teacher took while grading uh, a certain mod test. And I I don't know if you have nice literature that, that can help me because it, it's really quite impressive how little we know about how teachers grade and, and, and which decisions they take that lead to a certain grade. It's super subjective. Like we like to think that our grade is like this really well formulated thing that has really solid meaning and it's absolutely not it's super fuzzy now i'd love to look at, at what you found and and see um if any of the of the things that i've read or looked at um like talk to each other um about about how that works and informing that process
don't know if I have, I'm done with that paper. It's uh, it's still a lot of work, and I have another paper that I have to, have to write up to. So it's it's kind of busy, but it, it 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 must be there before the end of the summer. So. All right. Okay, then I think Adi, you already raised your hand before as well. Did you? Do you also have a question? Or you don't? Because then we can go into the break unless somebody else just wants to jump, Ryan. And I think I'm, I'm sure that you can also do that in the break. And also you can just stay here if you want or go back to the, to the main room and discuss. And we will see each other soon in half an hour, I believe. Let me check the schedule. Um, yes. In half an hour, we have the open discussion session for early career researchers with Bea, where you can, I believe, direct questions to Brian and everybody else. So have a nice break. If you don't want to keep discussing, stretch your legs, walk around a bit, get your heads free, get a glass of water, or like... What's the next session? Uh, Bea's discussion. Oh, okay. Bea will cool. lead a discussion um, in half an hour um, for early career researchers. And I'm really curious about this because I think we, we are all um, early, career early career researchers and we can help, help each other. I think, Philip, maybe you are the most experienced. And of course, Branko, because he already has his degree and we will all <laughs> once be like Branko. I, I would like we are all uh, young uh... Uh, young people and young research <laughs> in that context is look it better. Yeah, yeah, but right now you are you're our role model and we will all follow your footsteps and we will be ones like you. Get a beard and glasses. And then we get a doctor one step at a, at a time. So see you right. later. Grab some coffee. And thank, thank you. you. I hope you had fun. Thank you Absolutely. all. Thanks, everybody. Bye.